What you're watching is one of the most significant innovations in statistics in the past 30 years. It's a way to protect us from being fooled by randomness, a problem that lays at the heart of statistics and science itself. The significance of this idea and the methods behind it are so profound that they've been awarded $1 million in recognition of their impact. In this video, I'll teach you what this idea is, explain why it's so important, and give you a glimpse of how it helps us handle the complexity of modern datasets. If you're new here, my name's Christian and this is Very Normal, a channel for making you better at statistics. October means it's Nobel Prize season. Since I was a kid, I've always liked hearing about the Nobel Prize, to hear about what kinds of ideas gave the greatest benefit to humankind in the past year. And to be honest, it's rare that I ever understand the ideas themselves, but it's the inspiration that counts for me. The Nobel Prize reminds me that people are out there doing things to improve the lives of others, and it inspires me to try to do the same. That's the power of an award. Until recently, statistics didn't have an award like that. If you followed the channel for a while, then you know about the International Prize in Statistics. But there's actually another prize out there, and it's called the Rousseau Prize. The Rousseau Prize recognizes pioneering ideas in statistics, rather than a specific person. It's named after Peter Rousseau, an emeritus professor in statistics in Belgium, where the prize is awarded. In addition to this fancy medal, the winner or winners share a $1 million prize. It's very new. So far, it's only been awarded twice at the time I'm writing this. The focus of this video is the latter, given to Yoav Benjamini, Daniel Yakutieli, and Ruth Heller for the development of false discovery rate and methods to control it. Josef Hochberg was also a major contributor to these ideas, but unfortunately he had passed away in 2013. To really appreciate this award-winning idea, you first need to understand the concept of multiple testing. As the Rousseau Prize defines it, statistics is the science and technology of obtaining useful information from data, taking its variability into account. Love it or hate it, hypothesis testing is one of the most common and clear examples of statistics in action. It's the use of data to make a decision about how the world is, or is not. A hypothesis test outputs a probability, the infamous p-value, and we base our decision on its value. If the p-value is low enough, then we say, yes, there is evidence to reject the assumption that the null hypothesis is true, where the null hypothesis is a state of the world we want to falsify. Otherwise, we'd conclude, no, there's not enough evidence to reject it. When I say the p-value has to be low enough, I'm referring to the significance level, commonly denoted as alpha. The significance level indicates the threshold that we decide to reject a null hypothesis. It's an acknowledgement that sometimes the data will lead to extreme results, even under the null hypothesis. We have to draw a line somewhere. This is all fine and good when we just have one test and one decision to make. The problem comes when we perform many of these tests and decisions at the same time or even over time. Imagine that each of these p-values come from hypothesis tests where the null hypothesis was true. Even if we set the significance level to 5%, then by definition, that still means that 5% or one out of 20 tests on average will result in a wrongful rejection. But no matter how low you set the significance level, it's inevitable that someone will come to a wrong conclusion with multiple hypothesis tests. This is known as the multiple testing problem and has profound implications for science at large. Thousands of research papers are published every year, building on past knowledge and enabling future work. When you really dig into it, many of these papers are really just tons of writing wrapped around a primary p-value and maybe a few more secondary p-values. Thanks to multiple testing across these papers, it's inevitable that some of them contain results that aren't actually real. This is a major contributor to the so-called replication crisis in science, and it's a major issue that statisticians have to contend with. This sets the stage for us to talk about false discovery rate. To make our discussion a bit more concrete, we'll work through an applied example. Let's say that we're working as part of a clinical trial comparing a new drug against the placebo. We're specifically in charge of analyzing adverse events, which are unwanted or harmful events that happen after these compounds are taken. If the risks of the new drug outweigh its benefits, the company might stop working on it to keep people safe. There are many types of adverse events, but we'll just consider this set of 16. Our task is to compare the event rates between the treatment and the placebo groups and check if there are any significant differences between them. For the sake of teaching, I'm going to highlight the adverse events that actually have different rates between the groups. So this green means the groups have different rates, and red means they're the same. In reality, we'll never actually know this, but it's important that you know the ground truth. Our hope is that the data will lead us to these events highlighted in green. The specific test we use isn't important, but you can imagine we'd use something like a proportion test. 
These are the p-values that we observe. So assuming a significance level of 5% for each test, we'd reject these tests without considering anything else. When we reject the null hypothesis, you can think of this as a discovery. We assume that the world isn't interesting, the null hypothesis, but the data suggests that there's something worth investigating further. So a false discovery here is a test that rejects the assumption that the events rates are the same when in reality they are. This is also known as a type 1 error or false positive, but I think false discovery captures this idea the best, at least in my opinion. With this particular data set, there were 5 discoveries and 2 of them were false. So the observed false discovery rate is 40%. Now, there's a difference between this observed rate and the false discovery rate that won the Rousseau Prize. This 40% is associated with this particular data set and discoveries. If we were to conduct the same trial in different people, then we'll get different p-values and a different set of discoveries. To account for this randomness, Benjamini and Hochberg proposed that we study the expectation of these false discovery rates over all the possible data sets we could collect. That's what false discovery rate, or FDR, is. Remember that using a 5% alpha means that we'll have a 5% chance of making a false discovery with a single test. With 16 hypothesis tests, an alpha of 5%, and 30 people per group, the false discovery rate is 13.7%. That means that out of all the tests that we find the adverse events to be different, then 13.7% of them would be wrong. If we bump up the number of tests to 100, but keep the true discoveries at 5, then the FDR will skyrocket to 63% a clear demonstration of the multiple testing problem in action. But FDR itself is not a solution to the multiple testing problem. It's a way to measure it. As the saying goes, what gets measured, gets managed. Before FDR, one metric that was used to adjust for multiple testing was family-wise error rate. It's defined as the probability of making at least one false discovery among a collection or family of tests. It sounds similar to FDR, but the distinction is subtle. To control FDR means we try to keep the number of false discoveries to a desired amount. On the other hand, controlling family-wise error rate means we're controlling the probability of any false discovery happening. Family-wise error control is much stricter. How do we go about controlling FDR or family-wise error rate? The answer is in our decision thresholds. The rule we've been using so far is to count any test with a p-value below 5% as a discovery. We saw that that's not working as intended, but something we can do is to make our threshold stricter or lower and make it harder to reject the null hypothesis. If you make it harder to make a discovery, then by extension, it's also harder to make a false discovery. An example of this can be found in Bonferroni correction, a popular method for controlling the family-wise error rate. Let's say that we want to control it to 5%. To do this, Bonferroni correction says that we should take our desired control rate and divide it by the number of tests we're performing. 5% divided by 16 means that our new threshold for defining a discovery is about 0.3%. If we apply this new threshold to our original set of discoveries, then only these two tests would qualify. This approach correctly rules out the two false discoveries, but it also converts this one to a false negative. This leads us to the core problem of family-wise error control. By strictly controlling the probability of any false discovery, Bonferroni correction can swing too far in the other direction and make it too hard to make a discovery in the first place. This is why false discovery rate was such an important innovation. Rather than focus on preventing any false discovery, it might be more productive to accept that they're inevitable and come up with methods to limit how often they come up. In the same paper that proposed FDR as a metric, Benjamini and Hochberg also proposed a shockingly simple procedure for controlling it. In the honor of the authors, it's called the benjamini hochberg procedure, but we'll just call it the BH procedure for short. It goes like this. First, we need to define a false discovery rate that we wish to tolerate. I'll denote this as Q star, and we'll just pick 10% as a teaching point. Next, we need to sort out our observed p-values in increasing order and rank them. So the rank 1 p-value would be considered the strongest evidence for discovery. Instead of comparing each p-value to a static threshold as in Bonferroni correction, the BH procedure uses a dynamic threshold. This threshold takes the desired FDR, Q star, and multiplies it with the ratio of the rank of the p-value and the number of tests. Therefore, our lowest p-value gets the strictest threshold to be compared against. If this rejects, we move on to the second p-value and calculate it against its own threshold. This continues until we reach a fail to reject decision, and then the procedure stops there. One of the amazing properties of the BH procedure is that you're mathematically guaranteed to control the FDR at Q star. Of course, there are conditions to this guarantee, but even so, the procedure provides us a powerful tool for dealing with the multiple test problem. 
I want to take a step back and note that FDR and the BH procedure are part of a greater whole. I covered them to give you a taste of these ideas, but the Rousseau Prize was awarded not just to these ideas, but to a series of developments that expanded where we could use them. Daniel Yakutieli was instrumental in expanding the BH procedure to dependent hypothesis tests, a clear weakness of the original procedure. Ruteller developed methods to extending FDR methods to spatial signals, which includes the analysis of images. Imagine how difficult it is to deal with tens of thousands of hypothesis tests based on the voxels of a brain image. Modern technologies create new types of data that require more sophisticated statistical tools, and the Rousseau Prize has rightfully recognized one of these tools. That's it for this one. I hope you got something out of it. If you want more statistics content like this, then subscribe to the channel. You can also get notified directly about new videos by signing up for the channel newsletter. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.